I have no industry conflicts. And these are the learning objectives. We'll go through those. But let me start with a little review of what is my practice like. So this is just sort of a snapshot of uh, recent cases and uh, what kind of things that I routinely do. Uh, and I do pediatric and adult deformity. Uh, and sometimes it gets fairly severe. So here's a representative example of a neuromuscular scoliosis, 140-degree curve, uh, what it looked like. Uh, tractions shows great flexibility, corrects all the way down to 90. Uh, 3D CTs, which I think are helpful, uh, giving you a starting frame of reference about where you're going to go. Here's the intraoperative uh, navig navigation's been done, screws have been placed. There's no screws in the concavity of the apex, and the reason is we would have had to go through the abdomen to put them in. Uh, and uh, we thought about it, and we thought about a number of different things, and we said, okay, we'll work on this. I did a partial VCR, uh, loosened a bunch of screws as we progressively corrected it over, brought it around, got it to look something like this. So uh, it can be helpful in extreme scenarios. So the navigation system that I use has this kind of uh, graphical user interface. Uh, so you can see that we're attempting to put screws sometimes in pretty darn small pedicles, uh, and that uh, um, that we, we've been able to successfully do that on a number of cases uh, using the, the technology and, and reliably being able to do that uh, in a variety of levels. So why bother with navigation? Well, you've heard some of that discussion already. Why navigation and deformity? Because in deformity, it's harder. The anatomy is distorted. Uh, the pedicles are deformed. The concave pedicles are the most deformed, and the neural elements are hug hugging right up against those. We're applying tremendous forces today uh, to our fixation points, and that if we don't have good screw fixation, we're going to rip them out. And, and in 10 years, my return to OR rate so far has been zero uh, with navigation. And so I do have an intraoperative reposition rate of about 2%, and so we'll go through that a little bit. However, I want to talk about a case that came into me from the community. So uh, upscale, middle class uh, spouse, degen spondy, a routine kind of case, uh, you know, slam dunk, pedicles are all right, reasonable. And this is what was done in the community, and this is the way she presented to me. And so do you have to use navigation for everything? No, you just have to get it right. And whatever you got to do to get it right is what you need to do. Uh, these kinds of cases create interesting uh, challenges for the solutions. You know, uh, are you going to have vascular problems or not? Uh, but it doesn't have to be a complex case to have it go wrong. And then I see I do a fair amount of thoracic work and, and screws up against the aorta, nobody's idea of fun. Uh, and do not try to find a way to publish a new uh, pedicle screw injury, because I think they've all pretty much been reported already, uh, where there have been catastrophic events requiring people to go on bypass aortotomy and removal. And so the question then is, we can, in fact, do this. And the question is, what is it worth in terms of cost, radiation exposure, and alternative strategies? Part of it's understanding the morphology of the pedicle, and this has been my lifetime progress uh, uh, of watching us get to understand the thoracic pedicle morphology and doing a better job of it. But I think this is the point I want to make. So this is a case of someone who had been fused with a Harrington rod, then looking instrumentation, fusion mass, flat back syndrome, needed an osteotomy. This is a perfect screw trajectory through the fusion mass at L1. This is out medial. This is out lateral. So that's the tolerance window that you have for placing screws in these kind of cases. Are you that good to do it without adjunctive technology? Some people are. Uh, most people aren't. And I would say I'm probably not. And, and where we got started on this is interesting. Uh, a number of years ago, when we first started doing pedicle screws in the lumbar spine for scoliosis, we were worried were the pedicles big enough. So I would do preoperative CT scans to see if the pedicles were big enough. I tried to narrowly indicate to my radiology team where I wanted them to scan. They never got it right. They always scanned too much or the wrong level. And so we just started looking at it. And it turns out that T12 is always bigger than L1 which is contrary to what a lot of people thought initially, that pedicles get bigger as you go more caudal, um, but it changes at the thoracolumbar junction. So an interesting little tidbit. 
And that's led to both Larry Lenke and I look at scoliosis films now, and we look at the L1 pedicle. If the L1 pedicle is generous, it's going to be a relatively straightforward day. If the L1 pedicle is small, it's going to be a tough day. And pedicles in scoliotic deformity aren't normal. They distort and become abnormally shaped. Larry's uh, developed a classification system talking about whether or not there is a cancellous channel within the pedicle. And there are a number of patients and a number of pedicles where there is no cancellous channel, which makes it difficult to try to place a screw. So how good is good enough? Well, if you're a patient, 100% accuracy is what you're looking for, right? Uh, so the question then is, what's an acceptable rate of malposition? What's an acceptable rate of neurologic compromise, vascular injury? And then what are you willing to trade in order to avoid those? Uh, so if, so before the course last year, I did an extensive literature review. There hasn't been a whole lot. I've seen one or two things subsequently. Um, but what I would say is that people who advocate, well, freehand's always accurate, is there may in fact be a Larry Lenke effect. Larry's published 70 uh, articles on this topic. And so if his accuracy is better than the generalizable nature, then there's a bias in the literature about the accuracy of freehand screw placement. Current accuracy rates. So these are the meta-analyses, and I'm going to start with the Cosmopolis one from 2007, because this is the one that sort of got my attention. Okay, there's a little bit of difference there between NAV and not NAV, but when you look at a statistical way of analyzing it to saying what's sort of the worst case scenario, worst case scenario, accuracy of thoracic pedicle screw placement, 27%. I would suggest that all of us think that's not good enough. Uh, Subsequent data looking at it in uh, more recent studies show similar kinds of findings. So CT nav did better. And I, I wasn't quite sure that I understood how they broke it out into 3D fluoronav versus CT nav. Uh, but the bottom line comes out to show that navigation is better than without navigation. And then we looked at it comparing kids to adults, similar kinds of findings. Uh, subsequent analysis by Roger Hartle demonstrating that uh, screw perforation risk has decreased with NAV in the thoracic spine and in the lumbar spine. That operative time, they haven't been able to show a difference in the meta-analyses done to date. Uh, that blood loss, maybe slightly less with navigation. Uh, number needed to treat. I think this is the key take-home message. You only got to put in 11 pedicle screws to miss one and need to have a potential revision. And then the revisions range from no, or the malpositions range from no big deal to catastrophic. Uh, additional accuracies, screws position with freehand tend to perforate the cortex medially, whereas navigation seems to uh, err more laterally. And then uh, by region, you see the variability. And that I love this study out of uh, CHOP, where they had surgeons who did navigation and surgeons who just did check spins with intraoperative cone beam CT and found that there was a profound difference in uh, malpositioned screws. Um, and uh, the next argument is navigation takes longer. Well, I think that's very workflow dependent, not a lot of great studies. When we first started doing it, yes, it took longer. Now I think we're faster with nav than we are without. Potential sources of error. Uh, and this is my opinion rather than literature-based. Uh, in my OR, I think frame bang is the most common problem. Uh, and it's just when you've got people who aren't used to it that they uh, dislodge the frame, and you've got to be careful about that. Sometimes the anatomy, the spinous process just isn't very strong. Intersegmental motion is a huge issue. Uh, and, and Terry mentioned that with uh, unstable fractures. That's perhaps the greatest intersegmental motion issue. And so our workflow changed. We placed the screws first and then, and, and then do our osteotomies. Um, instrument deformation. Uh, so we've been a number of things, especially doing S2 ALR iliac fixation. System error, which I always used to like to blame as the primary problem, is actually fairly uncommon today. But I think finding ways to resolve discordant uh, sources of information is absolutely critical in your success. So we take a tracking probe and check anatomic landmarks that we recognize in open cases. And if we're off, then you've got to decide, is it worth another spin or not? So how good is it? So we did a study of what I like to call comparing 
the virtual screw to the actual screw, and that uh, um, it was uh, it was just a small sa sampling of patients. But what we saw is there's about two degrees of angular variation uh, compared to the virtual versus actual, and two degrees doesn't make a lot of problems if you've got a, a friendly pedicle. If you've got a less friendly pedicle, uh, then that may be more problematic. Is there a learning curve in, in, in pedicle screws? Yeah, in, in non-deformity cases, it seems like 80 screws gets you at a reasonable level. Uh, and uh, how about in scoliotic cases? Well, this is Barry Lahner's experience and showed that uh, over time he got better with about 150, 100 cases or so. Um, how about experienced surgeons versus inexperienced surgeons? So this is a group of surgeons in the Philadelphia area. And what they found, uh, so they looked at, they, they categorized folks. And what they found was that the accuracy rate was similar, but what was different was experienced surgeons had less medial breaches than inexperienced surgeons. So how do you check if the screw's in or not? Is palpation of the pedicle screw tract reliable? Well, we looked at this a number of years ago, and the bottom line is no, it's not really reliable. So we did it in a cadaver study and found that it, it was experiential dependent, but it's still not 100%. Another group of uh, fellowship-trained spine surgeons says, oh, that study's a bunch of crap, so we're gonna repeat it because we think we can tell, and they found essentially the same thing. Uh, and then there was a clinical study by uh, Ross Moquin out of Rochester where he looked at it and found out in his clinical series for which they all had post-operative CT scan that the accuracy was actually terrible for detection. And here's a clinical case uh, of his in that paper demonstrating both medial and lateral malposition at the same level. Uh, my personal experience with pedicle screws, I started doing thoracic pedicle screws in the in the, in the 90s, and uh, we got post-op CT scans routinely at that time. Probably not a great idea, but we did it, and we learned a ton of stuff. Uh, I moved to Minnesota in 2003, and we got navigation uh, in uh, 2007. So this is my first series, and we talked about the all-in versus the in-out-in, and we weren't good enough to get them all in at the start, and so we, we felt that it was acceptable to do an in-out-in, and we looked at uh, looked at all of the patients, and these were my two worst malpositions. The, uh, the one in the canal, the patient was fine, and I didn't revise it. And they had, I had about two-year follow-up, and he was working as a landscaper and had no complaints. The one that was out uh, laterally and, and next to the aorta, I looked at that scan, and I said to the family, I don't feel good about leaving this, and I took her back and revised that one. We tried to see was there a difference in uh, those with and without scoliosis, and what we found was that the highest miss rate actually was in the mid-thoracic spine, uh, but we couldn't tell the difference between, uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm screwing up on my advancement here. So we couldn't show a difference between scoliotic and non-scoliotic patients in this initial series. We just didn't have enough patients. Uh, but we did see that T5 to T8 was the area that we missed most frequently. Uh, that we then did a prospective cohort study in uh, Minnesota and looked at about 2,500 screws, and that, it, again, consistently T6 to T8 was the area where we had the most frequent malposition rate. Uh, it was worse in kids than adults. That would kind of make sense. Uh, and kids were actually better than the meta-analysis of the literature suggested they should be. And what we did was then measure the pedicle size. And what we found is once a pedicle smaller than about four millimeters, that's when you start to have a much higher miss rate. So there's sort of this tolerance window. And when we talk about accuracy, it's probably not fair to talk about that as a simple number because accuracy in a 10 millimeter pedicle is different than accuracy in a three millimeter pedicle. Return to OR rate, 0% uh, in, in 10 years now for me. Uh, with uh, literature ranging from 1% to 4%. I guess if you take the, the Vancouver study that uh, Daniil presented earlier, they had a 6% rate. We looked at it in congenital scoliosis as well, and here what we learned was that we were equivalently accurate, but 19% of the time there was no pedicle uh, present to put a screw through, so navigation really helped us in that regard. The other thing that uh, we've learned is that sometimes the anatomy is such that you need to take a slightly different trajectory to get an adequate size bone channel to put the screw in. Navigation allows that. 
perk screws. We've done uh, a fair number of my partners with their technique. Uh, this was my first major perk screw deformity case, uh, and that we've been pretty happy with our ability to reliably do that. Uh, demonstrated a very low uh, reposition rate intraoperatively. Comparing that to the literature, we've, we've beaten the literature on perk screws. Um, radiation is a concern. We've heard about that. I think newer technology results in that being a little bit lower dose. We've heard the advantages and disadvantages. And let me run through with you uh, sort of my concept of where I am today. And this is literally my patient from Tuesday. Uh, so a scoliotic deformity in a teenage girl uh, with a significant rotational malalignment and deformity. Here you see the reference frame attached and we typically get about six segments above. We've navigated and placed the screws. We do a check spin afterwards. All of these screws were fine. Then move the reference frame up, place the screws, and I don't know how well that projects, but if you see the, the T, let's see, one, two, three, the T4 screw, I don't like it. All right, then the other piece that I'll point out, this was how big her pedicle was in the, uh, in the axial plane in the concavity of that upper curve. When they look like that, I'll choose not to put a screw in. Even though we've tried sometimes, you could do an in-out-in or a lateral position. Uh, we've just chosen not to. And here's the check spin, okay? So I've put in probably 10,000 screws by navigation. We're not perfect. And so I like Ronald Reagan's quote, I trust but verify, and that uh, this screw was not good. Uh, the screw below and then the screws above were fine. So was this system error? Was it reference error? I'm not sure, but it was, in fact, an error. So we repositioned that, then put our rods in. Neuromonitoring monitoring was stable throughout. And then this is what her standing up x-rays from yesterday looked like. And so this is how uh, I expect things to go with deformity. And that our per screw time now including our nav spin and our check spin in deformity. It's about two, two and a half minutes uh, per screw. And could you go faster than that? Maybe, uh, but uh, I'm not sure I want to go any faster than that personally. And so that's where I am literally today or this week with the use of navigation. And so just uh, summarizing the learning objectives, uh, the, the group did very well on getting these right. So T5 to T8 is where we have our biggest problem. T12 is bigger than L1, and all of the above are potential sources of error. Thank you very much.